Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and insert extraneous material on H.R. 3648. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentlewoman from California, Ms. Lofnan, is recognized. Today, the House is considering H.R. 3648, the Eagle Act, a bipartisan bill that raises the per-country caps on family-sponsored immigrant visas and phases out the per-country caps on employment-based immigrant visas. The bill also includes significant improvements to the H-1B visa program that adds protections for U.S. workers. Now, our, our immigration system hasn't been significantly updated since 1990, and it really just follows the basic outlines uh, for the bill that was en enacted in 1965. The failure to evolve the immigration system has significantly damaged America's ability to compete in an increasingly global economy. The system is supposed to encourage immigration based on an individual's family ties to the United States or their ability to contribute to our economy, but it often falls short. For example, there are backlogs for families seeking reunification. That could be legal residents of the United States trying to get their spouse a legal residence visa. Uh, there are backlogs from some countries, but none for Western Europe. And in addition, the employment-based context, before a foreign national can apply for a green card, here's the process. Their employer has to advertise and demonstrate that there are no U.S. workers who are here who can do the job that they're being offered. This is to make sure that green card applicants are providing services and skills that aren't available in America. But after this initial test, which is merit-based, the per-country caps kick in. For example, under current conditions, an individual from Western Europe, a Western European country, applying for a green card in the employment-based second preference category based on a bachelor's degree would be able to gain their permanent residency in about a year. In contrast, an Indian national with a PhD and, pot and potentially superior skills might have to wait approximately 200 years. That doesn't help America. And I'd note also that the individuals who would ultimately uh, benefit from the elimination of what amounts to a racist system of allocating visas, 95% of those individuals are already in the United States legally working on a temporary visa, but in limbo. And as that limbo continues, their children who've been born, who've been raised in the United States, age out. And when they hit 21, they have to go back to the country their parents are from, but their parents remain legally in the United States. And so we're losing individuals who we need in America, including physicians. 25% of the MDs in the United States are foreign born, many of them are from India, and I have personally met physicians whose children have aged out, who've decided they have to move to Canada where they can get a green card equivalent in under six months. Now, the disparity, as I mentioned, in the family-sponsored context, uh, there are some family-sponsored immigrants from Mexico whose wait time is over 200 years before they're eligible to receive a green card. That doesn't make any sense at all, and in fact, it's a fraud on those applicants. We've been trying to change this system for over a decade. The Fairness for High-Skilled Immigrants Act, an earlier version of this legislation, first passed the House in 2011, and again last Congress. Iterations of this bill have been led by both Democrats and Republicans, and received over 350 yes votes in the House, passed by unanimous consent in the Senate. The Eagle Act is based on a bill that passed the Senate last Congress with additional restrictions to protect American workers and a longer transition period to ensure that no country's nationals are excluded from receiving visas while the per-country caps are phased out. Why is this important? People base their expectations 
on the situation as it exists. And the Congressional Research Service has analyzed this bill and has stated that no one currently in line is negatively impacted by this legislation. Now, I want to thank Representative John Curtis from Utah for working with me to introduce the EGLE Act. I appreciate my colleagues on both sides of the aisle who've previously supported this legislation, and I urge that we once again vote in favor of this bill. A system that's based on where you're born instead of what you can do is not what serves America uh, well. The system that's designed to advantage someone born in Western Europe over the entire rest of the world doesn't really recognize merit, which is what this bill is all about. We should have a system based on competitiveness, not the country where you were born. I um, would like to reserve the balance of my time, Mr. Speaker. The gentlewoman of California reserves, the gentleman from uh California, Mr. McClinton is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, ironically, this bill doesn't even serve the interests of immigrants from around the world, except for two countries, China and India. By removing the per-country caps on employment-based visas, the practical effect of this bill is that for the foreseeable future, the citizens of only two countries, China and India, will be admitted to work here. Workers from every other country will have to wait many years until that backlog clears. Supporters contend that, that no one currently awaiting a green card will be adversely affected. That, that may be true as far as it goes. But what they leave out is that this bill will produce long delays for future applicants from every country except for China and India. Even the Liberal American Immigration Lawyers Association points out that, quote, many applicants will now face longer wait times. Now, supporters are, are fond of comparing the populations of various countries as an argument that uniform percentage caps are unfair. But what they forget is that when a country's allotment isn't reached, its vacant slots then spill over to higher demand countries. India, for example, accounted for 35% of the green cards issued last year, five times their percentage cap. But that apparently isn't enough for the left. The bill also threatens our national security. China has been stealing U.S. technology for years through programs like the H-1B visa. According to the Washington Post, one such initiative resulted in, quote, the arrest of six Chinese researchers accused of lying on their applications about their ties to the People's Liberation Army, and, quote, more than 1,000 researchers who had hidden their affiliation with the Chinese military uh, fleeing uh, the U.S. within months. The supporters assure us that anyone with direct ties to the Chinese Communist Party is not eligible, but that completely ignores the fact that the CCP exerts coercive control over all Chinese nationals, whether or not they are CCP members, so, so this assurance is meaningless. As currently drafted, this bill would also result in the immediate ex exclusion from green cards of special immigrant religious workers from around the world for the next few years. Those cards will instead go to special immigrant juvenile green cards for unaccompanied alien children from the Northern Triangle countries. It is precisely this provision that's been exploited by the crime cartels in trafficking unaccompanied minors into this country, and this bill makes it worse. But the most pernicious provision allows certain temporary visa holders to file an application for adjustment for status despite the fact that no green card is available to them. That's the reason why you've got long delays uh, that the a gentlewoman mentioned. The result is that many temporary visas will essentially become permanent because the alien visa holders will be able to live and work in the U.S. as if they had a green card. And that raises an important question. What is it that the Democrats have against American workers? This bill is a direct attack on their job opportunities and livelihood. So much for the advice uh, to uh, unemployed uh, fossil fuel workers well, just learn to code. But all this becomes a theater of the absurd in light of the mass illegal migration that the Democrats have aided, abetted, and encouraged since they reversed the Trump border measures that have finally secured our borders. It was no coincidence that as the flood of illegal migration slowed to a trickle, working class families saw their biggest wage gains in decades, and the income gap between rich and poor began to narrow. Now that the borders have been collapsed by the Democrats, 
Those wage gains have been wiped out as millions of illegal aliens are deliberately allowed into the country to compete with those struggling American families, and the Democrats remain silent on this continuing crisis. The American people had trusted the Democrats to look out for their interests, and they're now discovering how tragically misplaced that trust has been. That's the crux of this bill, a big, fat middle finger to America's working families. And I'm afraid that won't change until the pe people responsible for these policies are turned out of office. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from California reserves. The gentlewoman from California, Ms. Lofton, is recognized. Uh, before recognizing my colleague from the Judiciary Committee, I would just like to note that the issue about the EB-4, which is the children, uh, is not correct. We, under current law, if you are a minor and you've been abandoned by your parent, you can go to state court and the state court will make a finding you've been abandoned by your parent and then you can become eligible for legal permanent resident in the EB-4 category. By the way, you are not under law able to then petition for a parent. Once the parent abandons you, they're out of the picture. That's backlogged right now from Central America. This bill will have the effect of easing those backlogs for the orphans from Central America. I would now like to recognize uh, a distinguished member of the House Judiciary Committee, the gentlelady from uh, Washington, Ms. Jayapal, for four minutes. The uh, gentlewoman from Washington is recognized for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank uh, Congresswoman Lofgren for her tremendous leadership, not only of this bill, but also on the Immigration Subcommittee as our chairwoman. Mr. Speaker, I rise in strong support of the EGLE Act. I believe I may be the only one or one of very few members of Congress who has actually been on an H-1B visa back when processing times to transition to a green card weren't nearly as bad as they are today. And it still took me 17 years and a multitude of visas to become a US citizen. Today, an estimated 1.6 million people in the family backlog and 200,000 in the employment backlog will die in some cases before they receive green cards because of an arcane system that puts a 7% per country limit on employment and family-sponsored green cards. Many of the people that are stuck in this backlog are Asian immigrants, people who were denied the right to become U.S. citizens for most of U.S. history, from 1790 to 1952, through the Chinese Exclusion Act and the Supreme Court's 1923 decision barring Indians from becoming naturalized U.S. citizens. Anti-Asian policies have informed these future anti-immigrant efforts. And as the first South Asian American woman elected to the House, I am very aware that Congress did not repeal that Supreme Court decision until 1946. The employment and family immigration process established in 1965 provided the first meaningful ways for Asian immigrants to come to the United States. And it remains the main method of entry for Asian immigrants because many Asian immigrants cannot access other pathways such as asylum or refugee status or diversity visas. However, because of the per country caps, there are lengthy backlogs to secure permanent status those backlogs can last for decades or even lifetimes. Someone from India or Mexico currently experiences a 200-year wait to secure a green card, while nationals of other countries wait as little as two years or less. The EGLE Act would simply ensure fairness by moving to a first-come, first-served system that would no longer discriminate by country of birth. And moreover, thanks to the bill's nine-year transition period beginning in October of 2024, it would not harm anyone that is currently in the backlog. The truth, Mr. Speaker, is that our immigration system is deeply broken, and it needs reform on every level. This is something that I dedicated two decades of my life to before coming to Congress. Whether you are from Africa or Latin America or Asia or the Caribbean, we do not have a functioning immigration system that allows people to come to America and do the work that we need or escape from war-torn or economically devastated countries or join family members. Congress has 
punted on comprehensive humane immigration reform for too long. And so we are forced to pursue piecemeal efforts for principled compromise to address the many broken parts of the immigration system while ensuring that no community suffers harm as another benefits. That is the nature of principal compromise. This is one of those bills that certainly does not accomplish fixing the broken immigration system. It does not do that. But it does do something very important, which is fix one piece of an immigration system that has been put together by these individual pieces that affect different parts of the population. And it does so, Mr. Speaker, without harming any other community. So to those of you who have waited too long for a green card as you've put down roots here and raised families and helped communities thrive across the country, I'm here to say we see you. A previous iteration of this bill passed the chamber with 365 bipartisan votes. I urge my colleagues to vote yes on the Eagle Act. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentlewoman from Washington yields back. The gentlewoman from California reserves. The gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Thank you, McClinton. Mr. Speaker. I yield uh, four minutes to my colleague from Arizona, Mr. Biggs. The uh, gentleman from Arizona is recognized for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman from California for yielding. I oppose the Eagle Act and encourage all members to do the same. The Biden administration has created the worst, absolute worst border crisis in our history, and congressional Democrats have done nothing to address it. They won't even acknowledge that there is a crisis, with the exception of the gentleman in the chair. The crisis is real. It's having a negative impact on communities across the country. But President Biden has more important things to do than visit the border. I visit the border on a regular basis, and every time I do, I hear similar message. First, the brave men and women of the Border Patrol are being overrun. They're tired of the administration not supporting their efforts to secure the border. Second, illegal aliens enter every day because they believe that the Biden administration is going to let everyone stay. Thirdly, our communities are running out of resources to deal with the real world impacts of the Biden border crisis. Cities like New York City and Washington DC complained when a few hundred illegal aliens were sent to their communities. But cities in Arizona are dealing with large groups of illegal aliens every day. And we are now told, uh, with Title 42 expiring, that they will do direct releases into Arizona's communities, because there's just simply no place to even hold them to process them. Since President Biden took office, U.S. Customs and Border Protection has encountered more than 4 million illegal aliens at the southwest land border. And during the same time, the Biden administration has simply released more than 1.4 million of those illegal aliens into the country. Under this administration, those aliens will never be removed from the country. And the 4 million number does not include the hundreds of thousands, probably more than a million of gotaways who enter the country illegally without being apprehended by the Border Patrol. For example, in November alone, there were more than 73,000 known gotaways, with estimates of at least one unknown gotaway for every known gotaway. That's a total of 150,000 people. We don't know where they came from. We don't know where they're going. We don't know what their intentions are. The numbers continue to get worse. Over the weekend, Border Patrol reported more than 16,000 encounters in two days. And that does not include known and unknown gotaways. But according to DHS Secretary Mayorkas, the border is secure. In fact, he testified under oath that DHS has operational control of the border. A week later, he backtracked on that statement because DHS does not have operational control of the border, despite the fact that he is required by law to achieve and maintain operational control of the border. Congress even defined what operational control means so that there would be no ambiguity. It, it is this, quote, the term operational control means the prevention of all unlawful entries into the United States, including entries by terrorists, other unlawful aliens, instruments of terrorism, narcotics, and other contraband, end quote. I look forward to Secretary Mayorkas testifying before the Judiciary Committee next year and explaining whether he stands by his previous testimony that he is maintaining operational control of our border. But we know what he will say, because last month he told the Homeland Security Committee that he believes the border is secure. The Democrat-led Judiciary Committee hasn't held a single hearing on the crisis, and many Democrats on the committee deny that there is a crisis. At a hearing earlier this year, one Democrat committee member referred to this crisis as the, quote, supposed crisis at the southern border, close quote. I wonder if she still thinks it's just a supposed border crisis. Some of us in this, this room today 
we know the reality of that border crisis. The committee hasn't held a single hearing on the flow of fentanyl into this country. The committee hasn't held a single hearing on the increase in the number of border patrol encounters with illegal aliens on the terrorist watch list. You would think that the committee would be concerned with the fact that in fiscal year 2022, Border Patrol reported encountering 98 illegal aliens on the terrorist watch list. And to put that in perspective, for the years 2017, 18, 19, and 20 combined, Border Patrol only reported encountering 11 illegal aliens on the terrorist watch list. Secretary Mark Mayorkas couldn't even tell the committee if any of the illegal aliens on the terrorist watch list were, who were encountered by CBP were still in the country. May I have an additional minute, please? Yield an additional minute. Gentleman is recognized for an additional one minute. Thank you. He has no idea where those individuals are. Republicans on the Judiciary Committee have repeatedly asked for hearings. Those requests have been ignored. Instead of conducting oversight, Democrats have advanced bills to provide amnesty and further weaken our security, which are incentives to those who wish to illegally enter the United States of America. And the EB4 issue, as explained by my colleague from California, Ms. Lofgreen, it does not change the impact as it provides an incentive for the cartels in their human trafficking exp expeditions. This bill will do nothing, the Eagle Act will do nothing to secure our border or address the crisis that this administration has created. But it will dramatically alter our legal immigration system in ways that most members do not understand or fully appreciate. Even the American Immigration Lawyers Association has opposed the bill. They acknowledge that the bill will benefit immigrants from a few countries, namely China and India, while adversely impacting those wishing to legally immigrate to the United States from almost all other countries. Instead of rushing to pass this bill today, the House should be debating and passing legislation to require Secretary Mayorkas to enforce the law, finish construction of the border wall, provide CBP and ICE with resources they need to enforce the law. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman uh, yells back. A gentleman from California resource. The gentlewoman from California, Ms. Uh, Laughlin, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd now like to uh, recognize the gentlewoman from California, my colleague, Ms. Chu, for three minutes. The gentlewoman from California is recognized for three minutes. I rise today in support of H.R. 3648, the Equal Access to Green Cards for Legal Employment, or the EGLE Act of 2022. While I, like many others here today, would prefer to see a more robust approach to fixing our broken immigration system, the bill before us today is an important step in the right direction. This bill will have a large impact on many immigrants and notably an overwhelming impact on Asian immigrant workers who have been historically barred from applying for U.S. citizenship. Right now, there are approximately 1.4 million individuals trapped in our backlogs waiting for available employment-based visas. The vast majority, as high as 80%, are Asian immigrants who are currently facing waiting times as high as 90 years from India or 44 years from China. Critically, the bill also more than doubles the per country limit on family sponsored visas from seven to 15%, bringing relief to the nearly four million people who are forced to languish in limbo due to a backlogged and broken family sponsored system. This backlog keeps families separated, causes birthdays, weddings, and funerals to be missed, and hampers the ability of immigrants to build their lives here in the United States while their families are waiting overseas. Additionally, while not all communities are facing the same impact as ours, I want to reassure everyone that this bill does not adversely affect immigrants from other countries and those who do not benefit directly from these provisions. Finally, I am proud that this bill does not include the racist anti-Chinese language that was added at the request of former President Trump to the previous iteration of this bill. Instead, the manager's amendment before us today simply replicates what is in current law for all green card applicants. While I continue to push forward for more comprehensive action that addresses many other parts of our immigration system for all immigrant communities, we must not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. 
and pass this bill today in order to help hundreds of thousands of immigrants who are stuck in our employment visa backlogs. The uh, gentlewoman yields back. Uh, the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Laughlin, is, uh, is reserving. Gentleman from California, Mr. McClinton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield four minutes to the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Bishop. The uh, gentleman from North Carolina is recognized for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the gentleman from California. Uh, in the hearing of this bill in the markup in April before the Judiciary Committee, I raised an amendment or proposed an amendment that we protect the United States uh, by, if this bill were to pass, providing that the Chinese Communist Party not be allowed to abuse it. Uh, I submitted for the record uh, evidence that Chinese technicians under HB1 visas had been part of the censorship routine at Facebook, uh, that H1B visa holders were involved in the Confucius Institutes in colleges and universities across the country, that we ought to, at a minimum, provide that the Chinese Communist Party not use our immigration tools as a means to impair American national security uh, and favor inculcation of the Chinese Communist Party's influence in the United States. In response to the amendment, the bill sponsor argued that the Immigration and National Naturalization Act already provided for defense against this threat. In fact, she gave a particular section of the code, section 212A3D, already fully took care of this problem. Except in further debate on the motion, or on the amendment, it became apparent after a while that no, section 212A3D only addressed risks involving aliens, not immigrants. And that was finally conceded, but the problem was not addressed in the markup. Now, as the bill comes to the floor today, it comes with a manager's amendment, not vetted in the Judiciary Committee as it should have been that day, and it doesn't do the job. It is loaded with exceptions that raise subjective questions that may be uh, circumvented by agents of the Chinese Communist Party to come into the United States exploiting this greater latitude for these visas. It, and I believe the bill sponsor spoke to it in her opening comments that there's, a, there's an exception. Yeah, okay, the Chinese Communist Party can't take advantage of this, but if somebody's an involuntary member in the Chinese uh, Communist Party or they they accept membership in the Chinese Communist Party for the purpose of obtaining employment. Well, they're not going to be excluded. Well, who won't say that that's what happened? And who's to decide now who was a, an involuntary member or one who was eager to participate? There are exceptions for close family members, exceptions for past membership. We'll offer a motion to recommit that will eliminate those exceptions. The motion to recommit would prevent the Department of Homeland Security from issuing an H-1B visa to anyone who is or was a member of a communist party or totalitarian party. It's just that simple. Why, if this is harmless and helpful, is the Democrat party so reluctant to provide for the most elemental of protection for the American people, that it not be exploited by the Chinese Communist Party, the most notorious adversary of the United States in the world, and to be done simply and completely so that, above all, we protect America in the course of doing this. And so, Mr. Speaker, if we adopt the motion to recommit, we will instruct the Committee on the Judiciary to consider my amendment to H.R. 3648 to provide real safeguards against Chinese Communist Party influence and espionage. I ask unanimous consent to insert the text of the amendment in the record immediately prior to the vote on the motion to recommit. I yield back. Without objection, gentleman yields back. Gentleman from California, research gentlewoman from uh, California is recognized. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I do want to address um, the issue of membership in the Communist Party. Uh, it has long been part of the Immigration and Nationality Act that if you are a member, you're not admissible. And I'll, I'll read you the section. Any immigrant who is or has been a member of or affiliated with the Communist or any other totalitarian party or subdivision or affiliate thereof domestic or foreign as, is inadmissible. Now there are some exceptions. For example, if your membership was um, not willing. And we do know that in some cases, and it's not just China, uh, Russia signed up uh, essentially Boy Scouts as members of the Communist Party against their will, and they were, you know, 12. So there, the consular officer can find exceptions based on that, and that's sensible. Now, the one uh, point that the gentleman did make in committee uh, had to do with applying sp explicitly this Communist Party inadmissibility provision to H-1B applicants. And we did take him up on that suggestion. In fact, um, that is a, a reasonable thing to do, and the gentleman made that point, because H-1B visa applicants have dual intent. And so the application uh, is and eminently reasonable when it comes to those dual intent uh, immigrants. And although we did not draft the amendment at the markup, we did uh, uh, contact the, uh, the gentleman's legislative director and went back and forth with the lawyers on the staff. So there was full uh, knowledge of this provision. And I thank the gentleman for uh, raising the issue. You know, it's been there's been complaints that we haven't had hearings. We've had a lot of hearings on this issue. And in fact, I can recall so well physicians. You know, a quarter of the physicians in the United States are foreign born. And most of those MDs were born in India. And they're providing medical services to underserved communities throughout the United States. And I've met many of them. We had uh, testimony from them. At, at our hearing in the Judiciary Committee. You know, to tell the, the people who are getting their medical care from these physicians that those, it doesn't matter, these physicians have to go to Canada and leave them without a doctor in their small town, that's not reasonable. And failure to act will result in that type of situation. In fact, it's already resulting in that type of situation. So, Mr. Speaker, I would now reserve the balance of my time. California, Ms. Laughlin reserves. Gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I yield three minutes to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Roy. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for three minutes. I thank the gentleman from California. I thank the speaker. I thank the gentlelady from California. Uh, every one of us here has significant groups of constituents and people across this country from the communities in question, from the uh, Chinese American communities, from the Indian American communities who have interest in wanting to make sure their communities can be represented and might well support some of this. But of course they do. Of course they do. Because what are we going to do here but pick winners and losers? Which is what this Congress does every single day. Pick winners and losers. But who are the losers on this? It's not big tech. It's not all the big tech, big corporations that are all happily to happy to collude with the people's house in order to get their labor supply and what they need, but who is going to be the losers? A lot of the hospitals. Why do the hospital association oppose this? Could it be that there's Filipino nurses and others who can be left behind are going to have to go to the back of the line? The Filipino nurses that were crowding the uh, room in which I was being treated for cancer at MD Anderson, which was chock full of Filipino nurses? Right? We're picking winners and losers here based on nationality in specific countries. And the gentlelady from California just tried to mount a defense that we're not going to open the door to Chinese communists coming to the United States, but conveniently, conveniently leaves out of the code all of the exceptions. The exception for involuntary membership, the exception for past membership, the exception for close family members. I mean, any idiot could drive a truck through those holes, right? There's, it, this is not a hard thing to understand what's happening. At the 11th hour, at the end of the 117th Congress, 
while Democrats are colluding with a bunch of weak-kneed Republicans in the Senate to pass a bunch of money that we don't have, to borrow more money that we don't have, to jam through a massive omnibus spending mill at the expense of the American people, this body is about to jam through a garbage immigration bill that will undermine people around the world seeking to come here who are going to be put to the back of the line while colluding with big tech and big corporate interests to do it. That's what's happening right now on the floor of the House. Because we never actually have full-throated debates about this stuff, contrary to what the gentlelady said. Oh, we just dismiss, say, oh, we have a couple of hearings. What, one witness mentioned something in a hearing and that constitutes a hearing? We're not having an actual debate here on the floor. We're having 30 minutes of each side getting up and saying their talking points, and then we'll have a vote, and then we'll move on. We're not going to be able to offer amendments on the floor because nobody in this body, none of the leadership of that side of the aisle or frankly off in this side of the aisle, gives a damn about my right to be able to offer an amendment on the floor of this House as my constituents gave me the power to do. We're here trying to defend the interest of having an immigration policy that is not based on the interest of one industry at the expense of countless other industries and at the expense of an immigration system that actually works while our border is wide open being exploited by cartels and China to kill 72,000 Americans last year, and my Democratic colleagues don't give a rip about a wide open border exploiting the American people and migrants getting abused in the process. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from California reserves. Gentle gentlewoman from California, Ms. Lofnan is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to take a note uh, on the issue of nursing, which is very important. As you know, we have, we've had a very tough time with nurses in America. Um, they've been through COVID. The trauma has been enormous. Um, and we have a need for more nurses while nurses are leaving the profession for understandable reasons. Part of the answer is nurses who want to come to the United States and practice nursing. That's not the whole answer, but it, it's a part of the answer. And so at the request and suggestion of senators who we've ta been talking about, there is a carve out of 4,400 visas for nurses and physical therapists during the transition period. We think once the transition is over, it will be adequately accommodated. But during that transition, that is included. And I would note that the Society of Hospital Medicine does support uh, this bill. Uh, we had, you know, three hearings in the Immigration Subcommittee on this topic, uh, and I think we had an understanding on the subcommittee kind of what all the issues were. This is our best effort at dealing with those issues. It has received broad support in the past, bipartisan support in the past, and I hope it would do so again. And with that, I would reserve my time. The gentlewoman reserves. Gentleman from California is recognized. Uh, we're prepared to close. Je if the gentlelady is. Uh, we have no, we were waiting, but our other speakers haven't arrived, so, so we're prepared so to close we, as so well. Here we go. Okay. The uh, gentleman from California is recognized. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think it's important to note why we have those per country caps. Ours is a nation of immigrants. Except for those descended from Native Americans, every one of us is an immigrant or the descendant of an immigrant. The American people are drawn from every country on this earth, and from these disparate and diverse populations, we have created one great nation, the American nation. Here, there is only one race, the American race. This remarkable achievement is made possible by a single word, assimilation. Our immigration laws were written specifically to accommodate that process. They were written to assure that as immigrants come to our country, they bring with them a sincere desire to become Americans, to raise their children as Americans, to acquire a common language, a common culture, and a common appreciation of American principles. That is the only possible way to blend so many discordant, disparate, and diverse populations into a common people devoted to the same principles that have produced the happiest, most just, most prosperous, most free, most advanced, and most envied civilization in the history of mankind. But assimilation is hard. 
As Winston Churchill said, from that very rostrum, we have not journeyed all this way across the centuries, across the oceans, across the mountains, across the prairies, because we are made of sugar candy. Becoming an American requires learning a new language, accepting and adopting new customs, adapting to a new culture, and accepting new beliefs. Assimilation breaks down if the concentration of immigrants from any single country reaches a level where assimilation is no longer necessary for that population. Instead of e pluribus unum, from many nations, one great nation, from many people, one great people, we instead see e unum pluribus, from one nation, many isolated, insular, and segregated communities that become foreign enclaves rather than an integral part of our national identity. We have all heard the heartbreaking tales of American workers not only being displaced by foreign workers, but being forced to train their replacements as a condition of severance pay. This bill assures a never-ending supply of foreign labor for American corporations. Under this bill, any alien on an employment-based green card waiting list for more than two years could apply for adjustment of that status. Once an alien's filed an adjustment of status application, he or she is eligible for a work permit. However, Unlike an employment-based green card, which generally requires a showing that the wages and conditions of Americans are not adversely affected, this work permit is considered an open market employment authorization document, meaning the alien can take any job at any wage and there are no protections for American workers. So this bill essentially converts temporary visa holders to permanent status at the expense of American tech work, uh, workers. This rewards the very same companies who for years have fired their American workers only to replace them with cheaper foreign labor. American workers, particularly black and Hispanic Americans, are gonna be particularly hard hit. Pew Research estimates that each group only accounts for about 9% of the STEM workforce, and this measure assures that competition for those positions will become much greater and the wages much lower. The per-country caps exist to assure that the population of no single nation can come to dominate the overall immigrant population coming to these shores. Thus, under current law, immigrants from one nation cannot claim more than 7% of the visas, but under this bill, the employment-based limit is eliminated. If this is allowed to happen, assimilation breaks down and the entire foundation of a nation of immigrants is shattered. As I said earlier, the practical effect of this bill is that the population of only two countries, China and India, will almost exclusively dominate the receipt of employment-based green cards for the foreseeable future at the expense of the people of virtually every other country in the world. Instead of an equitable distribution of green cards across all countries, they will in effect be limited to two. In one employment-based green card category, EB5, all the green cards will go to Chinese nationals for several years. In another category, EB4, religious workers will be precluded from getting green cards. Instead, these will go to alien juveniles from Northern Triangle countries who've crossed our border illegally. This imbalance would undermine the fundamental mechanism of assimilization, and I fear that's the point. Assimilation's become a dirty word to the left. They seek not unity, not one united people, but rather a people divided into warring racial and ethnic factions, divided by language, culture, race, ethnicity, and ultimately grievances. No nation can survive very long tearing itself apart this way. The collapse of our southern border and the refusal of the Democrats to defend the sovereignty of our nation from the unprecedented illegal mass migration that they've unleashed will spell the end of this nation if it's allowed to continue much longer. This bill is a small part of that policy, and it is destructive in its effect, if not its intent. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentlewoman from California, Ms. Lofton, is recognized. Uh, Ms. Speaker, I yield such time as I may uh, consume. Gentlewoman is recognized. Just a couple of uh, notes. First, this bill does not add any additional visas to the visa system. It's z it, it, th There were efforts to do that, plans to recapture visas. That was never agreed to by the Senate. And so this is an allocation of existing visas. It doesn't add a single visa. And as I said before, 95% of the individuals who would be 
uh, impacted already here legally in the United States. They are legally working in the United States. So it's no new people coming in either. It's people who are already here, no additional visas. We asked the Congressional Research Service to do an analysis because people wanted to know, and, and they were right to want to know, is there an, any adverse impact on Africa or on the Caribbean? And CRS told us there was no impact on Africa or the Caribbean. You know, somebody said, I want to talk about the EB-5 category because I think those who are concerned don't realize that we actually changed the EB-5 Act through the Integrity Act earlier this year, and due to those changes, the 32 percent of the green cards available every year for investments go, go to a new category. It's completely current. There is no backlog. I, I just want to talk a little bit about what we're doing here. My colleague from California said, you know, we're talking about picking winners and losers. You know, in 1965, the Congress did pick winners and losers when they designed this structure. The winners were Western Europe, and the losers were everyone else. Now, that system, although not, I'm sure, intended to be called racist, did advantage people from Western Europe to the disadvantage of the rest of the world, and we're still working on that system today. I think it's time to change that system. It's time to move to merit, not to race, not to the country you were born in. I'm not accusing any uh, critics of this bill. I'm not talking about their motivation, but the fact is, if we don't change this system, we're supporting uh, something that we did in 1965 that really has an effect of having race play a role in who gets a visa instead of merit on the employment side. I don't think that serves our country well. Put aside for a minute our ideals just to discuss the economic impact. We do well economically when the very most able people who want to come here and be Americans, to start companies, to invent things, are able to do so. The current system throws a wrench into that, and it's not good for the United States of America. I hope once again that we can vote to approve this bill. It doesn't do everything I'd like to do in reforming immigration law. As, as the gentleman knows, I have worked for many decades to do a variety of improvements, but this fixes something. Let's not say we can't do anything unless we do everything. That is a path towards uh, mediocrity. Let's do what we can do to make this system work better, to, to move it away from its racist origins, and have a system based on merit. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back.